Hi, this is Christina Dam, and this is Liberate the Podcast, where we educate, motivate, inspire, and liberate your consciousness. Hi there. I know that many of you are watching this and wondering, how can you improve your life a little bit? Can you improve your life a little bit? Um, the answer always is yes. No matter where you're at, we always can improve. We're on a we're on a journey of self-growth, of evolution. And we have here at Liberate some of the best practitioners that can help serve you to realign, get clarity, uh, to help balance you, or to help you get to those next levels and goals. You can visit liberateyourself.com and click on either Liberate Hollywood or Liberate Emporium and go to the practitioners and see the amazing practitioners that are available to you via Skype, phone, or in person. So it doesn't matter where you're at in the world. We're here to serve you, to help, to assist, to ascend, and to help you rediscover yourself. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Liberate the Podcast. Today, it's really exciting to have the guest that we have joining us because you might have heard of his teacher. He's uh, Osho's disciple. And not only was he Osho's disciple, he served as his attorney and even was the mayor of their organization and com uh, uh, community that they had in Oregon. And so I'm really excited because there's a documentary that's out on Netflix called The Wild Wild Country, and he's featured in it. So I want to welcome Niren uh, with us today, and he's going to talk a little bit about everything in the truth, but we're also going to hear about his teachings and what he stands for as he continues to spread this uh, consciousness and growth of uh, development for the world and community. So welcome. Thank you. So. Uh, I want to have everybody, I always like to hear a little bit about you, okay? I just gave you an introduction, but if you want to share a little bit on some of the points that I touched on or some things that maybe I missed and left out, so people can get a feel of who you are, and then we're kind of going to steer this conversation and where we're going. So you want me to say some stuff? Yeah, I want you to say some stuff, lots of stuff. I want everybody okay. to learn who you are. Okay. Um... 74 years old, coming up on 50 years as a lawyer, um, college and university in San Francisco, uh, partner in a big law firm in LA, fastest growing law firm in the United States while I was there. Um, in 81, I took a leave of absence. I was burned out, had a lot of power and success, and found that that wasn't it. Hmm. And, um, and I, well, basically, I, I went to, I want, I found out about Osho from a pal of mine and some friends. So I wanted to meet him. Okay. I went to India in 81. And uh, Osho, interestingly enough, Osho was in silence when I got there, which at first I thought, isn't this, isn't this hilarious? You know, I'm a word guy, right? trial lawyer, blah, 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 literature major, debater. So I, uh, at first for a moment I was disappointed and then I just thought, oh, this is perfect. We will see. So I got to, I, I, I sat with him in silence. At that time he was coming out every day, but he was in silence. And I immediately got the power of silence, the power of energy in silence, his energy in silence. Totally fell in love with him. A couple of days later, I was a disciple. When I had left my law practice, I swore I'd never go to another courtroom again. And six months later, I was back in court in a purple suit working for Rice and Dahl as a disciple, which was sort of hilarious. Kind of a bedazzled situation, if you know that movie. Anyway. Did you say uh, bean soup for Rice and Naan? Rice and Dahl. Oh, Rice and Dahl. Okay, yeah, the Indian dish, yeah. I thought we just, we were we had room and board in a place, to, we had a, a food, vegetarian food and a place to sleep. None of that was really my thing. I had, a few months before, I'd been going to the very best restaurants in L.A. and uh, at a wine cellar at my house and wine <laughs> locker at my merchant and belonged to a private club and blah, 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 blah. But, uh... 
my life changed when I met him. It was just like a door opened and I went through a new door. Fell in love with the guy. He was the most powerful presence I'd ever been around. And uh, in relatively short order, I became, he, ca he came to the United States. I didn't know he was coming to the United States. He came to the United States and I became his attorney after I was his disciple. Okay. Because um, he certainly needed American lawyers. Uh, they came, we came to the United States. They came to the United States. It had nothing to do with me at the time. They came to the United States because he had health issues and also because he always wanted a place where he could do his teaching. And he was so controversial. He, uh -huh. he always pissed off the priests and the politicians by calling them hypocrites, et cetera, et cetera. Liars, thieves, what they were, actually. But they yeah. didn't like that, somewhat understandingly. Yeah, people don't like to be called out on the truth. No. So when he was invited to come, uh, the people who wanted him to come, one of whom was an old pal of mine, um, he showed him a bunch of pictures of beautiful remote places in America that were available. And he showed him the Bill of Rights, okay. the Constitution. And he just loved that. He loved that freedom of speech, freedom of religion thing. Freedom of association, freedom of assembly. So he said, okay, I'll come. It's not like he made decisions about stuff, but people would ask him for his blessing. Mm. And they also wanted to know if he'd come because that was the only way they were going to be able to raise the money for the thing to happen. You know? Yeah. So he came and immediately the government was going after him, attacking him and the community. And I was his lawyer. It him pretty much from then on until he died. And I still do work for him, mostly intellectual property. He was real clear about keeping the purity of his message and his vision. Yeah. So I continue to work with intellectual property issues to make sure people aren't just saying what they want to say and calling it his work, you know? Yeah. So uh, as soon as he got over here, there was already conflict. I thought that that came years after the community started. No, no. Within months of, within, what is it, uh, four months after he came to the ranch, and I, no, three months after he came to the ranch, there was an INS investigation that was started because the father of a disciple, a woman who was a disciple, wrote to, he was a big Republican giver. Mm -hmm. And he wrote to his pal, Ed Meese. You're probably too young to remember Ed Meese. But he was uh, he was Reagan's counselor and then attorney general. Oh, and, wow. so, and, and so Meese turned around and ordered investigations to start. Within that same time frame, just a couple months, the uh, governor of Oregon said that if the neighbors didn't like us, we should go. The, the neighbors freaked out. They talked about constant fucking going on in the rooms because we had some people living in, in the town of Antelope. Uh -huh. Our ranch was 26 miles. It was 110,000 acres, 26 miles from the city of Antelope, which had 43 people in the last census, and it was officially a ghost town. So it goes down, um, and you were far away from the nearest person. It, yeah. Anyways, we had large of a ranch. And we bought some property because they wanted us not to have business stuff at the ranch, but to do it within an urban growth boundary. That's a land use issue. We might get talk about that or not today. Anyway, um, so we bought some property, and some people moved in there to operate to work on the businesses. Like they got freaked out. They said, "There's, you know." fucking everywhere. The fact is people were just holding hands and hugging on the out, uh, anything out of doors. Mm -hmm. We were a loving group, you know, and people were touching each other and, I mean, just in a hugging way, you know, nothing. And people were making love at night. We, Osho, Osho encouraged people not to repress their sexuality mm -hmm. because, it, as he pointed out, it wasn't that he, he used to joke, he said, uh, I've written 300 books, 298 on meditation and two on sexuality and they call me the sex guru he talked about our obsession with sex in our culture but he said we do he said if you repress any energy including sexual energy we only have one kind of energy we don't have sexual energy and 
football energy or whatever. We got one energy. Yeah. And the most basic is is sexual. It's down here. Yeah. If we repress that, we're cutting ourselves off from our energy. So he said, you have to allow that energy to move so your energy can rise mm -hmm. and rise to the higher chakra and open up your awareness, open up your consciousness. Anyway, they totally freaked out. It turned out, I found out later, they were complaining about this fucking sounds of it. It's because some guy who lived there who was against us was going and standing at windows and listening at night <laughs> and hearing people. Now, you tell me who's weird, the people in their bedrooms or this redneck who's coming in to listen at windows. Anyway, it was all crazy. It was a crazy time. So I was a lawyer. I was involved. We had a bunch of cases. We would have won them all, but the United States government, you know, if the United States government decided to get you, they're probably going to get you. Yeah. They got the resources, et cetera, et cetera. And they're willing to break their own laws when they need to, right? We've all seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we eventually made a deal for him to leave the United States uh, because of criminal stuff they were throwing. If we get into it, they were really violating their own laws. But I advised him to go there. I just didn't feel like we could protect him in the United States against the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we did go. Then he was back in India. I spent a bunch of time back in India, became a hypnotherapist and NLP practitioner and meditation teacher and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I spent... Hypnotherapy. I've do, I do hypnotherapy and NLP. I've been doing it for about the last 15, 17, 16 years. Yeah. I found it. I wanted to know more about the mind, and I wanted to be able to work with the mind and awareness. Yeah. I wanted to work with the mind and awareness. That's basically what meditation is about, right? It's about the mm -hmm. mind and awareness. Those are pretty much the only two things besides yeah. the body. So, um, so I use it in a spirituality sense. I use it. Uh, I have developed some practices, which I teach in my workshops. I developed some practices to allow people to develop moment-to-moment -moment awareness throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And to use NLP techniques and just awareness stuff to shift their attention from the mind to awareness, using the breath as a bridge and an anchor. Yeah. So that you can come back again and again to awareness, you know? Yeah. To present. present. Because what, most, what many people do, I think I did, I, I'm, I know I did this back in the day. You know, you meditate in the morning if you do meditation. Mm -hmm. And then you get up and you go to work and you completely lose yourself in yeah. the brain and in the society hustle, for the rest hustle. of the day. And then you yeah. come home totally exhausted and you're going, ha, ha, ha. So I te what I teach is for people throughout the day to use some rather simple techniques to come back to awareness. Come back to awareness mm -hmm. using the breath. And then I also do some techniques, I teach some techniques that are quite NLP related. You, were, you know, working with parts. Okay, yeah, parts integration and things like that. Yeah, so I do that with awareness and, say, early life parts. Helping people to establish communication and relaxation. Okay. So that's what I do. It's pretty much. So now, did, you said that when you were in India, you were really learning hypnotherapy and NLP and things like that. And when did you decide to come back from India back into the United States? It wasn't so much I. It wasn't so much I decided to come back. Osho died. Yeah. So, like, what happens to Miami if the sun stops coming mm -hmm. out? And he died now, in 1990, that, right? Yeah, but there are still ever since. I mean the. There are lots of people still coming to the meditation resort mm -hmm. in India. It's now called the Osho International Meditation Resort. It's a wonderful place. Yeah. Tennis courts, big swimming pool, nice hotel, uh, wonderful vegetarian food, pizza parlor, coffee club. It's a very cool place. And all of the meditation you can handle. Wow. Um, so, I, I, but it's... Uh, I'm getting old. It's hard on my body to go back now. I don't go back so much. And after he was gone, 
you know, he made me also made me his ambassador to the United States. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. So, which I thought was hilarious at the time. I actually wrote to the State Department and, and asked for consular plates, um, to which they didn't respond. <laughs> um, but uh, I was actually after he after he died. I was in a, after the commune was destroyed, and then after again after he died, I was in a I was very in a hard place for a long time. Mm, I, I wasn't ready for him to go. Now he taught celebrate everything. Yeah. But I'm afraid that that wasn't so easy for me after he died. Uh, well, he was a big transformational aspect and point in your life. It looks like you did a complete, you know, 180 and lived a completely different life upon meeting him. So there was so much there. And then to, you know. I just loved him. Yeah. It's like if your father dies or there's somebody you love dies. In a sense, spiritually, even closer than that. Yeah. I could tell you a story, but I mean. He was totally in my heart, totally in my being. When you truly accept a master into your heart, they move in. Yeah. You still got all your personality and all your decisions and all that sort of stuff, but your consciousness, if you accept them in your heart and into your awareness, they t the, what he used to say is that the master takes responsibility for the disciple. Absolutely. It, it isn't that he's going to tell you what to do, I mean, especially after he's dead. But he never was about telling you what to do. It was about him sharing the space, mm -hmm. sharing the energy, so you could imbibe his vibe, yeah. literally his vibration, his energy. And that was really powerful for me. And then when he was gone, I was just, I was still, the part of me, the part of me that was still identified with stuff, you know, I was, I just was... I was actually pissed off for a long time. I was not ready for him to leave, you know. Yeah. But that was what that was one of the reasons I think he left. So we would be thrown back on ourselves. Mhm. Mm and then we would do what he wanted to do. And what he wanted me to do was to share his vision in America. And I I've done that some over the years, but then when wild wild country hit, I'm basically a loner, okay? I'm ba I've always been basically a loner. The whole commune idea had very little interest for me. I really liked having my own place to live and going to nice restaurants and driving my Mercedes and ba 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 ba. I have I was I used to be a cook by trade. I like to cook. The idea of sleeping on some fucking cot or something had no no attraction to me at all. But when you when you give your heart to somebody, you know you find like people find themselves moving somewhere they wouldn't move otherwise because their husband or wife or beloved has a job somewhere. You know you do stuff you know, yeah. to be close to stay close to whoever it is you love, and that was it. I ch my life changed because I opened myself up to do. My life became whatever I could do to support his work, but also still my own stupid interests and neurosis, you know, good food and wine, NFL, that sort of stuff. Yeah. What are some of the, the top learnings or lessons or distinctions you got over the years of working with him and learning? Like well, the most important, the most, I mean, it's actually one of those things. Osho used to tell a story. He said, uh, he said, sometimes I feel like a little bit of a fraud. He said, I feel like a doctor with only one medicine. You come with me with your love affair problems. I say, I listen and I give you my medicine. You come to me with work issues and I listen and I give you my medicine. You come to me because you're anxious and I listen and I give you my medicine. But I've only got one medicine. It's meditation. Yeah. It's awareness. It's awareness. And that's what meditation supports. All there is, I mean, there is the body of but all there is, is awareness, presence, consciousness, now, right? Mm -hmm. Now, 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 present. And the mind, which is never in the present. It's always in the past or the future. Can't yeah. be in the present. But we give our presence to the mind. Mm. We, we bring our consciousness, and just because of our conditioning from, from infancy... 
we actually think our consciousness is part of the mind, but it's not. We, 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 we give our consciousness to the mind, which means we have no consciousness for consciousness, no awareness for awareness. Osho talked about cultivating, he talked about awareness of awareness. There's this vast awareness. There's this vast awareness. Space, emptiness, timeless, mm -hmm. into which energy arises, this vast space. And then we have our little window, our individuated window, individuated window of consciousness into this vast awareness. Osho called it awareness of awareness. Yeah. So what, what he talked about was, you know, basically mind and awareness and becoming, he, just, he said, the, he said if, if you just become more and more aware, nothing else is needed. With awareness, the more you become aware, everything that needs to change will change. Yeah. So he basically taught this identification from the mind using, using meditation, be in meditation, devised a bunch of meditations. Um, he actually talked about hypnosis as being useful for meditation mm -hmm. because it can help us go into a deeper place. Yeah. It can help but us calm I, the mind. Of course he didn't know about L NLP and such. So what I have done is... You do hypnosis? You, you've done yeah. hypnosis? So you know who Milton Erickson was. Yeah, of course. And you know who Bandler and Grinder were. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, the way they modeled Erickson, okay. I modeled Osho. Okay. And so I modeled the process of meditation. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it this way before. It's interesting. One of the things I don't think... I mean, I still, my mind happens all the time, but I don't know what's going to come until it comes. Yeah, because no, you're present. So, which is what I love about this stuff, because stuff comes up I never thought of, and I go, oh, isn't that interesting? Or sometimes I just think it's more of the same horseshit, but <laughs> my mind does definitely does mostly horseshit. But the stuff that comes from beyond the mind is often very illuminating to me. Well, what was I talking about? Oh, you're, you're talking uh, about uh, sure. modeling Osho. Exactly. So these practices that I have devised, the main practices are modeling Osho, modeling meditation, coming continuously coming back to awareness, using the breath as a bridge. And I have also a, another primary practice, which is basically a modification of working with parts. But then I do four or five, six, seven other ones, depending on where people are coming from. And I teach them all in my workshop. Okay. Some, I, I don't do very I don't I really am not into mantra meditation, by and large. Osho said that's not meditation. It's a relaxation technique. And as such, it can be helpful to people. But the re, what he was interested in, and actually he devised meditations that were very active meditations and this and that, dynamic kundalini. But... Those were all designed to support entering into and connecting with the space of silence. Mm -hmm. uh, as Lao Tzu said, the Tao, which, the true, which is the true Tao, cannot be said. It's the moment. It's the experience. Yeah. And so I do, uh, I do a couple of heart-oriented meditations um, and, and some other practices. And it's all about helping, it's all about assisting people to become more present, to become more relaxed, to find out what's in the way of that. Mm -hmm. Find out what's in the way of that in terms of their conditioning, habits, beliefs, ways of being. And then give, create, help them create more space for themselves to have a deeper understanding and if they want to, choose new ways of being. Yeah. And then create those ways of being. That's what I do. I like it. And what about an overarching like philosophy that you might have for life? So getting into the the idea of jumping in and allowing people to be more present so that they can create those shifts or different changes in their life if they want and just to become more aware and step away from the mind. But would there be an overarching philosophy that you kind of stand no. for? No. 
No. Osho was against philosophy. Osho was like Buddha. Yeah. Um, but he was like the mystics. He wasn't like the philosophers. The philosophers create these complex views of existence and how it works and all that sort of stuff. Osho wasn't into that. Osho was into people becoming free by using meditation to find a way to themselves and to find their own truth. That's the whole deal. He used to say all the time, he say he would say, I love this. He used to say, Don't bite my finger, look where I am pointing. Yeah. He was he was always indicating to people where they can find their truth, how they can find their truth. Total process orientation. And uh, I love that because people like that. I think that that's the number one thing that's wrong with people in the world is their inability to be their self, to be their truth, right? And, and if you can just be that and be comfortable with who you are and listen to what you want and what you actually desire and create, then you're going to be happy. And if you're happy, it's going to solve all the other issues because you don't see people that are unhappy or you don't see people that are happy making war and treating people badly, doing all the other things that we have going on. So I love that as a kind of, if that was the philosophy of just rediscovering yourself for those people that can't get out of their own mind. There's no philosophy. I know. Philosophy just, is a belief yeah. system. I know, but I'm just saying, if, if there was I hear what you're one, saying. you I know, what like, you're the, the bigger overarching kind of viewer perspective is to really help people connect to their self. Yeah, it's mysticism, not philosophy. Okay. And the thing is, give me a second, okay? Just give me a second to... It was something that was trying to come up, I think, and I'm going to just give it a little space. We have too much fucking conditioning already. We know we have too much knowledge already. We have too many beliefs. We have too many rules. We have too many, too much stuff stuffed down our throat from the time we're kids of how to be and the way to be. And what we got to do to make society happy, how to be a cog in the wheel, you know? Yeah. That's what the priests want. That's what the politicians want. That's what every, that's what our, in a sense, that's what our parents want. They want us mm -hmm. to be, they say they want us to be happy, but they really want us to be good little kids, you know? Yeah. So. To play by the rules. <laughs> he, was, he was not about that at all. Now, he did acknowledge that ru rules are necessary. He said, as long as people are unconscious, you got to have rules. I mean, otherwise, we'll have... People like Trump doing whatever they want to do. You got to have some rules. Yeah. Crazy people would do what they want to do. Violent, angry people. There's so much of that out there, you know. So you got to have rules to protect on some level. He said, but once you become aware, once you become aware, the rules become irrelevant. Because out of awareness, out of consciousness, you will have compassion. You will have understanding. Hmm. And you will do, you will see what is helpful and necessary and appropriate. And you will do that without any rules. Yeah. You'll do it because it's the natural way of things. We get into, well, Osho talked about it, Lao Tzu talked about it. We get into the, we first we, we find, we get in touch with something like flow. We get in touch with energy. Okay. And once we and we can only do that by disidentifying from the mind and getting in touch with it's it's actually happening in our human system. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So then when we get in touch with energy and flow. We feel we start to feel our own energy and flow. What feels right? What feels wrong? Not emotionally, but just actually sensing as we have greater awareness. And then we become aware of the of what the flow is around us, and the principle of affinity comes into effect. We're drawn to that which we emanate and seek. We move away from that which is harmful and negative. Yeah. So eventually we find our way to our to our place in the river. Mm. And then the river carries us to awareness, to the sea. And and that's what Osho taught. That's what I'm trying to share in my own way. But again, I do try and be real clear with people. He was a master. He was enlightened. He was a master of masters. That's not me. I've been, in most of my life, I've been the most angry motherfucker I know. 
And it's out of my anger and frustration and anxiety that I came to Osho and out of that that I can't learn to develop these practices to deal with my own stuff. Yeah. And what I have found in working with people, again, it's like anything. It's like meditation. You can't sit down one time and accept it to be, expect to be transformed. It's a practice, right? Meditation itself is a state of this no mind yeah. um, awareness. But what we do is meditation practice, which are things we do to cultivate that state mm -hmm. of awareness. And... The practices I teach, the people who have taken them on and practiced them sincerely find powerful changes. It's just it's just how it is. Yeah. You know, it's because it's not it's not magic, it's just these practices are based on fundamental ways things are. And if people do them, the experience changes. Yeah. Of course. It's also true that when you start to open up the space and you're not, what you've been repressing your whole life starts to come up. You have to be present to fear, right? You have to be present to all that stuff. And it's scary as hell. Mm -hmm. But these practices and meditation give us a larger container to be able to allow that and to feel it and to get that and to get that. When we open ourselves up and the pain comes up, then it can pass through. Yeah. When it's down there, held down there, it's just black and ugly forever and, and comes out in unfortunate ways. Yeah. When we open up and start to allow it to arise to the surface and be released, again, there's better flow, better space. And then the container gets some, bigger and bigger. Yeah, and not as much friction. And I think that it's important to go back to the point that you were sharing so eloquently about being the river that just allows it to in in the flow that goes into the ocean and being in that flow space when you tap into the presence because so many people feel that things need to be a certain way or have to be a certain way and that creates all this resistance and disharmony instead of just being that vibrational energy of flow and exactly and that's exactly. what you're when you're Buddha's first Buddha's first noble truth is that life is filled with suffering and ends with death. Mm. And Buddha's second noble truth is the source of all suffering is attachment, fear and desire. Yeah. So it's all it's all about it's continuously letting go, finding the flow and going with the flow. Mm. Which is about awareness, just creating more and more awareness. So and the thing is it feeds on itself. The more awareness you create, the more then that arises. Osho said that which we that which we water grows. Mm. If we water the mind, the mind is stronger. If we water awareness, awareness grows. So the more we can bring our attention to awareness through meditation, through these kinds of practices, the more we give energy to awareness, the more awareness can grow. Yeah. And so for somebody that might be listening you know is there like a beginner technique that you could share with somebody to start to get into that daily practice state of awareness well uh yeah like a, um, a simple one you know for somebody that's just starting out like you know the, more, the simplest way is do insight meditation do vipassana that's the most fundamental invitation in a meditation that Buddha taught and that his Osho has taught. And it is it is the core of what I teach as a daily practice. Hmm. And our, if people want to know my particular practice, they can do a workshop, I do sessions. If they even send me an email, I will send them the basic practice um, so that they can follow that. I, I don't like it. I, I do send it out to people, but if people haven't ever done anything like this, it's sort of hard for people to get. You know? Yeah. Some people, I some friends of mine are talking about putting together some video stuff so this stuff can be available. Absolutely. And that's, that's probably going to happen fairly soon, I hope. But who knows? It's not up to me. It's up to existence. Okay. And, you know, so I know that um, you, you are 
you do talks, you do these workshops. We're going to have you at Liberate Hollywood on uh, Friday the 27th and Saturday the 28th. Now, the 28th, it would be more this learning. No, I think like, it's Friday and Sunday now. Oh, it's Friday and Sunday now? Yeah, that had to get moved for some okay. reason. Oh, whatever it is, I'll make sure that in the footnotes it's it's posted correctly. Um, but uh, the Friday is a talk, and so you're going to a lot of Q and A about your experience being a disciple. And the Saturday or Sunday, whichever that workshop is, this is where people can really get to know and learn these practices and hone in on creating this awareness for their self in their daily life to have these shifts to go through this process to step a little bit away from that mind and more into that awareness to feed that water to water that awareness in a sense that's exactly right the workshop the work i do handouts during the workshop right so people can take this stuff with them um by the end of the day you will have done the two most basic practices multiple times so that you're comfortable with it and can do it by yourself gotcha um and then I give people hands. But again, it's like the first time you've ever done something. You, you got to do the practice if you're going to. I mean, I've gotten to the point now. It's all a lot of it's just about attention coming back to the breath. To me, to me now, my it's like during it, just during our conversation, my attention has come back to the breath maybe 50 times. Hmm. It's just how it is. Once you do it for a while, it just becomes habitual. As soon as there's a break, as soon as somebody else is saying anything. You just notice your breath, and then you're back into breathing. You're back in awareness, uh, and in that awareness, there's just it's just a different space. You know, your hearing is different, your seeing is different, your listening is different. The relaxation starts to occur, and especially in this crazy world, very helpful for people to have something like this so that they can chill the fuck out. Yeah. And what type of people do you find are most attracted to your work? Well, to tell you the truth, people are in pain. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's, the motiv that's the motivation for change, right? You know, push on something hard enough or something's conflict. Okay, I need something to be different. Help me, right? You know, that's when people... Almost, almost nobody comes to meditation because they think it's such a good idea. <laughs> people come to meditation because they're in pain and they want to find a way to get some space, get some relaxation. Or they're finding something in their life, they're driven by anger or fear, whatever it is. You know, we've all got our stuff. And they want to have more, they want to find some inner peace, some relaxation, a different way of being. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly why people come to me. Although it's interesting to me, some people come very, very early on in their work. You know, they've got something going on and difficulty in their relationship or whatever. And they come out of that. And for them, they may just do the practices for a while, and that's all they need because they got a yeah. little, little more space, a little way to deal with it. Some people come to me who've been meditating for years and years, mm -hmm. but they still have these habitual things in their lives, and they don't know how to bring the meditative experience to their daily life, to their moment-to-moment -moment life. They all that some some of those people come, and they really take it to the level that their awareness is at, mm. at that time, to move it along. Like Osho said, you know, if you think of awareness as a big train, nobody gets on in the same station, gets off in the same station. You know, we're all on our own ride. Yeah. And so different people come in different places, and they get what they need, and then they do what they do. Yeah. And then some people stick with it for a long time and see the the benefit of spiritual development too, right? Oh yeah, most of the people who've stayed with me for a while, it becomes habitual for them, mm -hmm. and they, I mean, it makes such a change in their life. And then they stop it for a while and realize they're falling back into old habits and blah blah blah, and they go, "Oops, got to get gotta back go on back. that, <laughs> right?" Got to go back to the practices, and they do. Some do, some don't. So people, you know, we are very, we're varied in how we live, right? Yeah. Very, very complicated and yet super simple in the same sense. Exactly. 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 Oh. What else would you like to share? Open floor on anything. Well, 
What comes up for me is one of my favorite blessings. Okay. It's actually from a guy named Rumi. Mm -hmm. If I would share anything, it would be silence and some space. Osho used to say, if you could just sit with me, I wouldn't say anything, but you can't sit still. So I tell you stories and I talk. But the, the transmission is in silence. Mm. All me, all understandings happen in silence. The mind then starts turning them into words, but all understanding, all awareness is in silence. That's how it arrives. I mean, then the mind turns it into words, but it arrives just as a, an understanding. May the love we share here spread its wings. Mm and fly across the earth and sing its song to every soul that is alive. May the blessings of your grace, my Lord, be felt by everyone. And may we all find the light within. Find the light oh. within. Oh. Beautiful. Definitely drop me into the presence. <laughs> Beautiful. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much. You know what namaste means? The light in me recognizes the light in you, the divine light in me. Exactly. So, such a lovely way to say hello and goodbye, huh? Absolutely. Ah, oh, it has been a pleasure. I'm going to make sure that I put all of the, your contact information on this podcast uh, so people can find you, your coaching site, everything like that. Um, I mean, I feel like this is such a beautiful spot to kind of come to a close. Um, but I'm looking forward to meeting you in person in a couple weeks. Thank you, Christina. I look forward to meeting. Thank you. Have a beautiful evening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. So we have some of the most interesting, unique, and amazing meditations, I think, in the world. I mean, we have past life regression meditations, guided hypnosis meditations, Akashic Record meditations, as well as healing meditations. Our meditations are pretty cool. And they're not just about stillness of mind and peace and sit there, hmm. I mean, we have those too, don't get me wrong, but these are about meditations that are going to shift and change and you're gonna walk out of there feeling lighter, freer, healed, and even getting guidance and insight. So come down, experience one of our meditations. They're pretty badass. If you enjoyed this conversation, like it, subscribe, and share it with your friends. If you want some more amazing resources on your path of liberation, head over to liberateyourself.com and sign up for our mailing list. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram at Liberate Hollywood, all one word, or Liberate Emporium, all one word. Until next time, liberate yourself. <laughs>